So many years of catastrophe, more than six million refugees, it could be you and your family, folks from your home and your history. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out for Palestine. Ah, hello, hello, hello. This is Palestine Today. I'm your host, Kathleen Wells, and welcome to Palestine Today, a radio program dedicated to news about Palestine. And my host, my co-host, British journalist and campaign filmmaker, Harry Fear, is reporting live from, where are you, Harry? Germany, on a a lecture tour, Kathleen. Well, tell us about it. Well, you know, every so often I get invited by university groups and campaigning groups like, for example, here in Germany, Cafe Palestine, to give my thoughts about the situation in Gaza, what we can do to help in the West, and about um, uh, the the realities of my experience living in Gaza. Um, And these are often highly constructive um, talks uh, in universities and in uh, institutes and uh, student groups and etc. And so it's something really fulfilling to take the time out of the, the busy Gaza reporting lifestyle to actually uh, reach out to people and facilitate campaigning and activism and awareness building uh, in different oh, yeah. for example, this week in Germany. So t- talk to us about the response you're getting. What has the response been like? Well, actually, um, thankfully, the response really is incredible. Um, I mean, the idea here is not, of course, that all of the audience doesn't know anything about Gaza. The point is to at least try and increase the outreach of these campaigning groups and uh, organizations that invite me to try and for sure get um, a few more people into the fold of caring about Palestine than otherwise would have been. And actually, thankfully, um, the organizers in this uh, last few days have been reporting that they've had up to 50 percent uh, new faces coming to the events to hear the talks about uh, Gaza from my point of view. So this is a really great indicator that actually um, this is something worthwhile doing at bringing new people into the fold of you know, awareness and, and sympathy and, uh, and support and actually people who, getting people willing to do something. Just now I got an email from uh, someone who's asking for advice about how to go to Gaza themselves. So actually it's something really fulfilling and really worthwhile doing, albeit absolutely exhausting travel. Oh, you're kind of going in and out for hours and hours, but it's, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. And talk, speaking about uh, bringing new people in the fold, that's what I'm interested in doing is bringing new people into the fold, getting new Americans, new Westerners who to listen to KCAA, to listen to Palestine today, because we're giving you information you won't get anywhere else. It's the unfiltered truth. You won't get it anywhere else, not in the mainstream media, that's for sure, but you can get it here at KCAA. So although we have sponsors, our our sponsors have funded a limited amount of shows. So we need your help. We need the help of listeners. So I'm making a plea again to go to my website, thekathleenwellshow.com, and make a donation so that we can continue to bring you more, de- more beautiful shows about Palestine, more beautiful shows with Palestinian interviews to you new Western listeners. I want to bring new Western listeners into the fold so they know what's going on in Palestine, so they don't have to rely on the mainstream media. So that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about you, the listener, making a donation because you value this program. You value hearing from Palestinians. You value getting their perspective, their point of view, where you will get nowhere else except, what, two other stations? Um, Jeff Blankford Station in Mendocino County, and um, Don Basanti, KPFK, and then here, KCAA. So go to the KathleenWells.com website, make a donation so that we can bring you more shows, so that we can keep the show on the air. Uh, I cannot be more forthright with you about this issue. Please make a donation. So is there anything else you'd like to add, Harry? No, uh, as always, just to say that we do need this this uh, support to pay for the costs uh, of the show. And from the feedback we get, this is a show which is vitally important. So, of course, please, please do support this project. 
Exactly. Well, our guest for today uh, was going to be Jack Persikian. However, he is unavailable, unfortunately, but we have um, Diana Abu Ali. She is head of research and collections at the Palestinian Museum. So we're going to bring her on and see what she can tell us about the museum. Hi, Diana. Hi, hello. So I, I re- let me first say, Diana, that I appreciate you at the last minute sort of uh, sitting sitting in place of Jack. Something unexpected came up, and he wasn't able to join us. But I'm thankful and grateful that you're able to join Harry and I. Um, you're welcome. My <laughs> pleasure. Okay, that's great. So, you know, tell us about the Palestinian Museum. What was the motivation to get it started? I know that it is um, next year it will open in Bizet, which is a town located in the West Bank. What can you tell us about the museum? Uh, the Welfare Associate, I mean, the, sorry, the Palestinian Museum um, is the brainchild of an organization called the Welfare Association, which is a Palestinian NGO that operates uh, mostly in the, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, and also in the refugee camps in, in Lebanon, um, provides development and humanitarian assistance. And board members about 15 years ago came up with the idea of establishing a, a museum, um, a modern museum um, in Palestine, um, mostly dedicated to uh, the memory of the, or commemorating the memory of the Nakba, which is the um, catastrophe of 1948. Um, what you know what we're breaking up you know what i'd like to do diana i don't know if you can hear me but we're having audio difficulties we're breaking up why don't we take a break and let me see if i can work on these audio audio um snafus that we're experiencing because you're breaking up why don't we take a break joe uh diana stick with us we're going to come we're going to take a break and we'll be right back okay thanks more than six million refugees it could be you and your family forced from your own man your history we are the people and this is our time stand up sing out for palestine Can you smell the aroma of sweet, delicious fruit and flaky, melt-in-your-mouth crust? What is that? It's Cobbler Mania. Cobbler Mania is a specialty dessert company founded several years ago that sells delicious fruit cobblers that are baked daily and sweetened with diabetic-friendly agave. Agave, you ask? Yes. It's like sugar, but not sugar, and better than sugar. Cobbler Mania cobblers are sold at the Torrance, Hollywood, Culver City, San Dimas, Marina Del Rey Farmer's Market. Also, apple and peach are sold daily at the Golden Bird in Los Angeles. You know Golden Bird that sells the fried chicken? At 83rd and Western, daily apple and peach cobblers. And yes, guess what? They're coming to the Pomona Fairplex Truck Fest. In fact, they're there right now, Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Gate 1. Some of the favorites, peach, apple, mango, blueberry, peach, blackberry, blackberry, apple, white, peach. If you go to the Pomona Truck Fest Gate 1 on Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. and mention me, Kathleen, you'll get something special. You don't want to miss it. I've had them. They're delicious. Playgrounds for Palestine is a non-for-profit 501c3 organization dedicated to upholding the Palestinian child's rights to play. This is a right enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We operate through a volunteer board and staff. The generosity of our supporters and a lot of heart. To date, Playgrounds for Palestine has constructed 15 playgrounds in Palestine, as well as refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. To contribute to this most worldly cause, please go to our website at www.playgroundsforpalestine.com or send a check to Playgrounds for Palestine, P.O. Box 559, Yardley, Pennsylvania, 19067 at www.playgroundsforpalestine.org. Are you fascinated by the Middle East but worried that U.S. foreign policy may lead yet to another war? Do you care about civil rights? For the past 30 years... 
The Washington Report on Middle East Affairs has brought its readers the real news, minus the corporate media spin. Read about Palestinians trying to survive the world's largest occupation. Learn how your hard-earned tax dollars fund that illegal occupation. Find out how much your members of Congress has received from pro-Israel PACs, and much, much more. Visit the Washington Report's website, www.wrmea.org, or call 888-881-5861 to request a free sample copy. Better yet, subscribe. It's only $29 for nine issues. Mention Palestine today and get a bonus gift. A journey of a thousand words begins here at AM 1050 KCAA. So many years of catastrophe, more than six million refugees, it could be you and your family, forced from your home and your history. We are the people and this is our time. Stand up, sing out. Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome to Palestine today. And we took a break because we were having some audio difficulties, but hopefully now everything is smoothed out. Uh, initially, our guest was going to be Jack Persikian, who is the director of the Palestinian Museum, which is scheduled to open in the West Bank town of Berzet Letter next year. However, something, he, you know, he, he was caught in traffic or something and didn't have uh, Internet uh, connectivity. And so who is here in his stead? And just as good and just as great is Dana, Diana Abualu, who is the head of research and collections for the Palestinian Museum. So welcome, Diane, again. I'm welcoming you. you again because the first time we were having audio problems. Welcome again, Diana. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my, quest, my question to you was, what was the motivation to have a Palestinian museum? Talk to me about that motivation. Well, well, the origins of the, the idea um, started in about 1997-98. Um, board members of an organization called the Welfare Association, which is a, um, a local Palestinian NGO that provides development and humanitarian assistance to Palestinians um, in Palestine, West Bank, and Gaza Strip, as well as to the Palestinians living in the camps, refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, they came up with this idea of, of, of establishing a, a museum uh, to commemorate um, the memory of the Nakba, which is the catastrophe of 1948, um, in which um, about 750,000 Palestinians were displaced and dispossessed of their of their property and became refugees. Um, it made sense that that's what they were planning to do with this museum because that was, of course, the 50th anniversary um, of that event. Um, so they were planning to build this this museum, um, and then, of course, in 2000, we have the Second Intifada, and that sort of derailed uh, the efforts towards establishing building that museum. Um, it, they revisit this idea um, in the mid. 2000s, about 2007 or 8, um, they establish, uh, they hire a new director uh, called Bashar, his name is Bashar Dumani, he's a professor of history in the United States, currently teaches at Brown, and he, um, with a team of people as well, re uh, conceptualized, reconfigured the idea of the museum, turning it from a sort of commemorative institution to one that is more about the living history of Palestinians, one that is more of a mobilizing institution, one that is um, engaging and interactive and really try to highlight um, what Palestinians have accomplished um, in their history um, to show that they have agency, that they have um, a stake in their, you know, in, in, in their lives and they're in shaping their own history. So it's a much more um, mobilizing um, institution than it was commemorative. So looking forward instead of looking back. Um, and since then, um, they've been gradually, you know, working towards uh, setting up um, a team. Uh, we've we've uh, hired a lot of staff. We have a new director called Jack, as you know, Jack Prusakian, who's to speak with you today. Um, and we have a, another, a, you know, a group of, of professionals that are working at the museum, and hopefully we'll have it open um, in a year and a half or so. Well, that sounds wonderful. Well, I mean, looking at the website for the museum, which people should do, uh, should, should Google uh, Palestinian Museum, um, it, it looks like something almost futuristic or something that certainly one wouldn't expect to be developed um, in, in Palestine. I mean, can you talk about the obstacles to actually physically developing uh, the place? 
Um, I mean, it's well. How, how, do, how do you mean? How? What kind of obstacles? I mean, it's we're under occupation. I mean, I mean, if that's sort of what you're you're hinting at. Um, I mean, we have you know the the sort of uh, we have permission from the Palestinian Authority to build it, um, and it's going to go ahead. Um, but of course, there's going to be challenges. Um, you know, like I said, we are under occupation. You never know, you know, what can happen. Um, so there are, those are the, you know, we're not sort of building a museum under normal circumstances. So there are going to be a lot of obstacles to, that we're going to face, not just in its construction. Um, I think, you know, if, you know, we're left to sort of build it, the building can be built. But I think the difficulty comes when, um, you know, we want to sort of, uh, borrow objects, you know, create exhibitions, um, start having events, then we might face difficulties. Um, given I mean, the what, what I was climate. thinking, uh, what I was thinking about actually was more, in a way, political difficulties. I mean, something as symbolic as this uh, project surely is, in a way, actually a political or PR threat to Israel. I mean, I've heard before um, of projects which have been pressurized or their funding has been uh, somehow usurped or, or something has happened logistically to prevent a powerful project happening. But it seems that it, it's going ahead great. It's, it's going ahead, yeah. I mean, we, all our funding comes from um, private donors, um, all of them Palestinian. Many of them, if not all of them, are members of this, uh, the Board of the Welfare Association, very, who very generously have supported us. Um, so in terms of funding, we're, you know, it's, um, we're not dependent on outside donors or foreign donor, donors. So um, we're kind of, um, that's, that sort of threat is not something that we're, we're facing at the minute, at the moment. But yeah, it is, I mean, it, it is a, a political statement in the sense that, um, you know, we are building a museum that's dedicated to celebrating Palestinian culture in an environment that is, in a political environment that is um, set against, you know, its, uh, its celebration. In fact, tries to um, diminish it or tries to eradicate it. Sure. I mean, there is that. for me, it seems something enormously powerful. I mean, um, uh, one of the things which certainly resonates with me about this is it's about, in a way, powerfully getting Palestine, uh, the, even the history of Palestinians, recognized as something which people should be paying attention to. I mean, this is something which, in fact, um, as, a, as a means of uh, comparison, actually the tragedies that have been done against the Jewish people has been perfectly it's a perfect example um of the the proper um appreciating the history and making it accessible to people and etc oh. and i understand the museum obviously is not just about the nakba but it's also about celebrating culture and etc but oh. it is something really i think very powerful here well, I think it's powerful, too, because we're told that Palestinian, a lot of people who argue against uh, what's going on, against Palestinian people say that Palestinians don't even exist, didn't exist. Sure. I mean, these are, yeah, cheap, you know, cheap shots that, you know, um, you know, these are just propaganda kind of lines of people, you know, I mean, people who say that it's, it's, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, they're they're they're. I know very important, you know, politicians say that all the time, but that's just, it's just a ridiculous statement. Um, we are here, you know, the museum is dedicated to celebrating, um, to getting people, you know, interested and excited about Palestinian culture. We're very positive about, we're not here to sort of, like I said, commemorate um, the past, although the past is, of course, very important. What the, the injustices that were done to the Palestinians cannot be ignored at all. They, they do have a very special place, but we're really keen to show how how much Palestinians have, in spite of the odds, in spite of the difficulties, really continue to thrive as a people, as a culture, and have expressed themselves in various ways. Um, that's what we're also trying, hoping to do with the museum, is to have it as a place where Palestinians, wherever they live, whether in Palestine or in the diaspora, um, in the neighboring Arab countries, in Europe, or in the, in the North and South Americas, whether they, you know, it's going to be a place for them where they can express um, you know, for them what it means to be Palestinian. They can engage with other Palestinians um, and with other people who are interested in learning more about, about uh, Palestine um, and its people. Now, this is a big statement, isn't it? Because, I mean, obviously, um, Bears 8, it's not, uh, you know, a it's not a tourist destination. No. Um, so <laughs> the, making, the making of this is a very hopeful 
uh, step, really. And it does, I mean, is it intended that it says, look, we are staying here, we're on the map, and you're not writing this out of history? Absolutely. No, I mean, our physical presence, you know, in Birzeit um, is definitely, you know, saying that we, we are here, we are here to stay. Um, you know, that goes without saying this is our land, this is our homeland. Um, but our, you know, as beautiful as the building is and as, um, as proud of it as we are, you know, of the design, we're happy with it, we're really excited about it, and we're happy that, you know, that there is going to be a museum of this caliber and of this, of this grandeur in, in Palestine for people to, you know, experience and to enjoy. Um, we're equally um, keen and um, concerned with those Palestinians who cannot reach us. I mean, it's, it's, we're very aware of the fact that most Palestinians will not be able to come to Birzeit and visit us and visit the museum and interact with our exhibitions there. Um, so as a result, we're very keen on making our, visual, our virtual presence, um, you know, as powerful and as important as it can be. We, you know, we're very keen about setting up, for instance, um, virtual exhibitions, uh, an online archive, that people who cannot reach us can access what we have through, you know, our online portal. Um, we're reaching out to our audiences um, because they cannot come to us, and that's the sort of, I mean, that's the situation that most, you know, that we as Palestinians find ourselves, find ourselves in. So um, we like our building, we love it, but um, it's not the most important thing um, for this museum. So it's, it's a transnational museum, which is how we sort of like to think about it. Oh, I like that idea, transnational yeah. museum. That yeah, sounds... I mean, you know, you, you know, this, you know, we, it's a situation that we have to deal with. I mean, you know, we're, we're not, I mean, I should say that we're not a national museum. This is not a museum being set up by the Palestinian Authority. This is a private museum. But we're dealing with an audience um, that is spread out throughout the globe um, and who cannot, for various political reasons, cross borders and come visit us. So we have to be, we have to think beyond sort of the borders and political boundaries and try to reinvent ourselves as a museum in a way that, as many people as possible can access us, and we can sort of interact with them and interact with each other. Oh, I Diana, like... what, what hopes do you have for, for outreach to Israelis? Israelis are more than welcome <laughs> to come visit us in our museum. They have um, freedom of movement throughout uh, Palestine. They, um, they are as welcome as anybody else. Well, you know, I want to say something. What, <laughs> what I want to say is that this is humongous to me, what it represents, the symbolism more than just the museum itself. Just the idea is so powerful because here in the West we hear so many people denying the occupation, denying that even Palestinian Palestinians were even there present in the land when Israel's Israelis came to the land. So this museum is humongous. It's powerful. You know, and I think about the Holocaust Museum, what impact that museum has had transnationally on all the world. So let's hold, I want the Palestinian Museum, or I should say it would be fantastic if the Palestinian Museum would be impactful for the entire world, because what will it do? It will educate people. Do you, do you agree with that? Are you asking me? Yeah. Yeah, I do, I do. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I should say that we're not the, I mean, there are 30 other, about 30 other museums in the West Bank already. We're not the only museum nor the first museum. Um, but I think um, what might differentiate us from, from the others is, is the way in which we're, we're putting, you know, sort of front and center um, our outreach um, program, let's put it that way, our um, desire to sort of reach out to people and to educate. Um, you know, we're going to, we're very keen on setting up a very, a very, you know, rigorous and, you know, exciting education program as well. Um, but I should say that we're also, you know, the Palestinian Museum, like these other museums, like other cultural institutions in Palestine and abroad, we're all trying to sort of educate, so to speak, about Palestine, about the situation in Palestine, about our history as well. So we're not, I don't want to sort of, you know, make our museum seem special or, or you know, pioneers in that sense. You know, we're, we're just one of, of a, you know, you know, 
large number of institutions, uh, brave institutions and, and brave people who work there that have been trying to um, promote, um, you know, our, our cause and, and uh, to tell our story to the world. I mean, it, it's that telling of the story to the world, which is one of the fundamentals, I, I personally think. Because yeah. obviously Israel's domination of its worldview is so powerful. Um, and really sure. any, any new project helps uh, with that. Something which I found really exciting was this um, uh, virtual uh, museum. And I wondered, could you talk a little bit more about um, how that will work and how people will be able to access it? Well, it's, it's still under construction, so to speak. We're still, you know, we, we really are at the beginning stages of, of, of building this museum and, and the virtual museum. Um, but what we're, you know, hoping to do is, for instance, part of this virtual, our virtual presence will be a, an online ar archive um, of documents, of photographs, of uh, sound recordings, of video recordings. Um, whatever we're able to, you know, digitize, we're going to put online and make it accessible to anyone who has, you know, an internet connection. It's very important for us that we make all the documents and, you know, objects and um, our collections that we're, we're currently building, that we're going to make it accessible to, to as many people as possible. We're also trying to work with other organizations, uh, Palestinian organizations and, and Arab organizations, that if they have collections as well, that we can, you know, together, um, you know, th through some sort of consortium, digitize all these documents and, and images and, you know, sound, the audiovisual recordings as well. Um, so this is what we're trying to do. I think that the idea of the virtual museum or a virtual presence is to make as much information available to people so that they can sort of access it and, you know, come to their own conclusions. You know, we might develop an exhibition, you know, on a certain theme or concept. We might somehow translate that, you know, such that it can be, you know, experienced visually um, or virtually, you know, online. But ultimately what we're hoping is that people can come either to the museum physically or visit you know, are these online exhibitions and kind of, you know, come up with their own questions, come up with their own answers, you know, think about things. I mean, that, that's sort of what we're trying to do is not give people a, an authoritative narrative about some aspect of Palestinian history or culture, but rather to present them with, you know, information in a particular way, but in a way that they can start asking questions of themselves. Ideally, there would be a sort of, you know, a place for dialogue in this as well. We don't know how that's going to be. But it's really to make it as interactive as possible so that, you know, people can express themselves, people can ask questions of each other and of themselves. Um, we like to say that we really want this museum to be a safe place for unsafe ideas. Um, and by that we mean that, that ideas that sort of question maybe traditional narratives or accepted truths and, you know, uh, force people to, to really think critically about about, um, you know, the world around them. Wow, I love that. A safe place for unsafe ideas. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to steal it. because <laughs> <laughs> I stole it. It's not my, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's something that I've heard in kind of museum, you know, write, writings on museums and the sort of literature. But, um, yeah, I think it's a good way to sort of um, talk about what museums are supposed to do. And I don't think, you know, the Palestinian Museum is the only one that does that. But any museum... Um, that has a strong educational sort of um, component or sees itself as as a place where an alternative space for education that's not, you know, t it's not a school or a classroom, uh -huh. but that it's a place where people can come and dialogue and, you know, interact and converse and exchange ideas. So, um, we want people to start to think, to think critically, and that's what a good museum does, I think, and that's what we're trying, we're hoping to do. Um, how we're going to do it, that's the harder part. Um, but, you know, we've still got a few, you know, a ways to go, and, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully um, do some good work. Sounds fantastic. Well, well, why don't we take a break now and open up the phone line? So are you open to taking any phone calls from any questions or comments from callers? Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I would love for, well, we'll talk about when we when we come back after the break. So we're going to go to break right now. We're opening up the phone lines, and that number is 888-909-1050. So if you have questions for Diana Abula, who is the head of research and collections at the Palestine Museum, please, please, please call in with your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Again, that's 888-909-1050. We're going to take a break right now, and when we come back from the break, we'll take phone calls. Thanks. Palestine. 
Can you smell the aroma of sweet, delicious fruit and flaky, melt-in-your-mouth crust? What is that? It's Cobbler Mania. Cobbler Mania is a specialty dessert company founded several years ago that sells delicious fruit cobblers that are baked daily and sweetened with diabetic-friendly agave. Agave, you ask? Yes. It's like sugar, but not sugar, and better than sugar. Cobbler Mania cobblers are sold at the Torrance, Hollywood, Culver City, San Dimas, Marina Del Rey Farmer's Market. Also, apple and peach are sold daily at the Golden Bird in Los Angeles. You know Golden Bird that sells the fried chicken? At 83rd and Western, daily apple and peach cobblers. And yes, guess what? They're coming to the Pomona Fairplex Truck Fest. In fact, they're there right now, Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Gate 1. Some of the favorites, peach, apple, mango, blueberry, peach, blackberry, blackberry, apple, white, peach. If you go to the Pomona Truck Fest Gate 1 on Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. and mention me, Kathleen, you'll get something special. You don't want to miss it. I've had them. They're delicious. Playgrounds for Palestine is a non-for-profit 501c3 organization dedicated to upholding the Palestinian child's rights to play. This is a right enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We operate through a volunteer board and staff, the generosity of our supporters, and a lot of heart. To date, Playgrounds for Palestine has constructed 15 playgrounds in Palestine, as well as refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. To contribute to this most worldly cause, please go to our website at www.playgroundsforpalestine.com. Org, or send a check to Playgrounds for Palestine, P.O. Box 559, Yardley, Pennsylvania, 19067, at www.playgroundsforpalestine.org. Are you fascinated by the Middle East, but worried that U.S. foreign policy may lead yet to another war? Do you care about civil rights? For the past 30 years, the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs has brought its readers the real news, minus the corporate media spin. Read about Palestinians trying to survive the world's largest occupation. Learn how your hard-earned tax dollars fund that illegal occupation. Find out how much your members of Congress has received from pro-Israel PACs and much, much more. Visit the Washington Report's website, www.wrmea.org, or call 888-881-5861 to request a free sample copy. Better yet, subscribe. It's only $29 for nine issues. Mention Palestine today and get a bonus gift. Don't miss a minute of the action. Check out the podcasts at www.kcaaradio.com. The station that leaves no listener behind, AM 1050 KCAA. So many years of catastrophe, more than six million refugees, it could be you and your family, forced from your home and your history. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out for Palestine. Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome to Palestine today. This is KCAA. I'm your host, uh, Kathleen Wells. My co-host is British journalist and campaign filmmaker, Harry Fear. And Harry is actually in Germany. Tell me what you're doing in Germany, Harry. I forgot. Oh, maybe we lost him. Did we lose Harry, Joe? Oh, we lost Harry. Did we lose Diana too? Oh, I'm sorry, Kathleen. Oh no, still here. Okay, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so I didn't hear all of your question, but I'm in Germ- Germany. I'm speaking um, at a bunch of locations. Uh, the main host is Cafe Palestine, which is, uh, I mean, its ethos is similar actually to the Palestinian Museum in the sense that it's meant to be a place for uh, dangerous ideas um, uh, uh, in a sort of safe context, and with the history History of Germany and Israel. Um, actually, um, speaking about Palestine and Germany obviously isn't particularly a safe prospect, and so uh, it, it's been it's been great um, to 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 reach out to people here who want to get an insight into um, 
into into what's happening in Gaza. And in a way, my experience has been that for, for the audience members, it's in a way kind of a relief to hear articulated um, a position which suddenly for them appears to be more pro-Palestinian in a context which is so pro-Israeli uh, in the German context. Oh, I can imagine it being a very delicate, a very delicate situation to even raise these issues. So we're talking, we're speaking, my guest today is, our guest today is Diana Abuala, who is the head of research and collections for the Palestinian Museum. And if you'd like to call in to ask her any questions, please feel free to do so. The number is 888-909-1050. So if you have any questions for Diana, please call in. So Diana, what I, you know what I want to talk to you about, and this, I, I wanted to say this before the break, but I, and I didn't, so I'm going to say it now. It's like, we would love to work, Harry and I would love to work with the Palestinian Museum to have some episodes of Palestine Today at the museum. We'd love that. What do you, what do you think? It. I mean, am I we putting you on the spot on the radio? Am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we'd, we'd love we'd love to have you. We, we'd love um, we 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 need support. I mean, we need uh, we need to get the word out there, and we'd love to to have you um, do your you know something. Have huh? your shows at it. Yeah, something. Yeah, <laughs> we're, no, we're, no, we're we're welcome to that. Oh, Diana, we'd, could you talk a bit a bit about the? Actually, I mean. I mean, how easy has it been for you to get media attention for, su- su- for something which certainly to us seems um, obviously very newsworthy? Um, uh, sorry, I didn't hear your question, but I think you asked if, how hard it is for us to get media attention. Is that your question? Oh. Yes, sorry, yes, yes, indeed. Yep. Um, we've, I mean, we've had uh, two events um, that were covered by the um, international press. We had an event at Art Dubai, which is a, an international art fair um, held there in March, and we had a sort of reception. Um, you know, we felt that there was a, there was a large you know uh, number of, of journalists and people interested in art and culture, and so we had an event there, and we, we received a lot of um, actually a lot of international press and local you know Emirati press as well and Arab press. And uh, we had a groundbreaking ceremony or, you know, laying up the foundation stone in April, which also garnered a lot of uh, media attention. So um, those two events have actually generated some, you know, some hype about the museum. Uh, a lot of good, uh, some, some, you know, some trolls on the Internet, but um, otherwise it's been it's been pretty positive. Yeah. Um, but we're still, you know, I, I should Again, repeat that we're still at the beginning, you know, stages. We're still working on, you know, setting up a team, um, you know, building the museum itself, the building, um, getting our programs going, uh, working on our opening exhibition. So I think once we have, um, you know, we're ready to open, I think we're going to start getting more and more media attention. Um, Diana, um, when I visited the West Bank a couple of years ago, I mean, I was struck by the way that many of the settlements, you know, slice up the natural landscape and just uh, uh-huh. kind of appear, um, I don't know, in, totally incongruous, actually, in the setting. And I read in yeah. the, the, the statement, uh, a statement from the museum, that it obviously sets about, um, you know, putting itself on the landscape in, in a more kind of holistic uh, way. Could you just describe that? Um, I think the idea is that, um, well, at least talking architecturally, I mean, the idea was sort of to, um, the architects were inspired by the um, the hills of Bruzade. So the West Bank is very hilly. Um, and, um, you know, traditionally what, what, you know, farmers used to do is, is, um, is build these terraces to sort of catch the rainwater, I guess. And um, it was more effective for, for farming and for um, agriculture. So um, there, is an, there was an attempt to sort of, you know, kind of uh, be inspired by that, that sort of, um, you know, arid but still somewhat uh, um, fertile landscape. And um, it's supposed to sort of, you know, mimic the terraces and that work. What we're also trying to do, um, because it's a large plot of land, um, to, um, you know, set, set up these gardens, um, a lot of open green spaces um, in the, in, you know, next to the museum that would showcase, you know, local, you know, vegetation, local trees, herbs, flowers, and so forth, um, to make it sort of, you know, outdoor. I guess uh, not a museum, but sort of to to just showcase um, Palestine's natural uh, treasures. It's 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 you know the wow. 
you know, the plants and the flowers and what have you, which is very rich. I mean, it's a very rich, as you know, um, yeah. Well, you know what, Diana, you spoke about, we talk, we touched on this aspect, this idea of there being political implications, ramifications regarding the museum. And that, and I think you said that the Palestinian Authority has, what is it, approved? Is that the right word? Or has... Well, I mean, we, we have permission to build. I mean, there's, there's, you know, you, like any other, you know, if you're going to build an institution or a foundation, what have you, you have to get, you know, um, uh, approval of the authorities, and we have that, you know, go ahead to build. And in fact, the you know representatives of the authority um, were at the groundbreaking ceremony. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of you know local support for us, definitely. Um, what I was also trying to say is that we're not uh, a national museum. We're not a museum that's being set up by the Ministry of, of Tourism and Antiquities, which is responsible for um, establishing, you know, or is responsible for museums in the West Bank. Um, we were a private, we we're a private museum, and we're privately funded as well. And, and you mentioned that there were 30 other Palestinian museums. There, Are, there's a lot of museums in the West Bank. Yeah, a lot, they're, they're mostly small scale, but they're, um, you know, there's a lot of, yeah, there's, there's about 30 in the West Bank, and I, and I think it also includes some, some of the museums in, in the Gaza Strip as well. Um, a lot of them are, you know, are museums that showcase archaeological artifacts. Um, as you know, it's a very rich, um, you know, place for archaeological ruins, um, you know, ancient ruins, Roman, Byzantine, and so forth, even into the Islamic period. Uh, so there's a lot of those uh, museums, you know, cater to the archaeological heritage. There's a lot of sort of what you might call ethnographic museums as well, where they showcase, um, you know, traditional costume, uh, traditional, uh, um, you know, objects that were used uh, in the house, in the home, and and, you know, stone mills and so on and so forth, musical instruments, things like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just can't help but think that a museum in Palestine would have political significance. It would make it would be a political statement. Do you do you know what I mean? Because it's uh, exemplifying what was in the past it's ex it's showing what has happened in the past yet and what has happened in the past has been denied by the by many in the west particularly the united states the narrative has been uh sort of um twisted and changed and so i would think the museum would sort of like set the narrative straight so to speak does that make sense yeah, I mean, I think I think we're political in the sense that we're we're saying that, you know, there, there is a people, there are Palestinian people, they exist, they have existed, um, they have a culture, they have a history, um, they're they're you know productive members of society. Um, I think that's where we're you know we're most political, um, and of course you know the sort of the, the narratives that we're we're you know going to be addressing or the the themes that we'll be addressing in, in the ex exhibitions that we will um, be presenting at the museum. Um, not to say that that we're we're not our, our, you know our intention is not to present a counter narrative to you know um, some Israeli narrative. We're not sort of engaging on their terms we're, we're you know we're coming up with ideas and concepts and themes that are in, that are important and interesting to us as palestinians um, could you talk so a little bit generally mm -hmm. diana about the yes. this kind of will to resist through creativity and affirmation of culture and and constructive uh, action i mean of course uh, i mean when i visited the west bank um i i saw for example uh theater and cultural groups and the the, the ethos ethos there excuse me was to yeah to, to resist by instilling culture and um, pride in, in, in skill and etc. I mean, could you talk generally about this in the context of, for example, the West Bank? Um, I mean, you know, there's, I guess I could say that, you know, living under occupation is, is you know, extremely difficult and, and extremely frustrating and debilitating. And it, it really requires a lot of um, determination to sort of get through it every day. Uh, so what we're, we're trying to do is that when you sort of focus on the, not that the negative is, I mean, I, I, I sound very American when I say I'm going to focus on the positive, but I think that when you sort of showcase or when you highlight um, that, 
you know, we as a people, the Palestinians as a people, are productive. They have, they're creative. They have theater. They have poetry. They have, uh, you know, um, they write literature. They um, paint. They draw. They build. Um, you show that um, that there is a sort of indomitable human spirit, you know, um, present in, 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 in the Palestinians as a people, as a collective. And I think that's very empowering. And I think that's what we're trying to do is to empower people to sort of, you know, focus on the, what we've been able to achieve. And that's, that's interesting to us. And I think we want to look at why that's interesting and how we've been able to express creativity, how Palestinians have been able to express their creativity to give um, expression to their identity, who they are, what they do, and to look at that expression. Um, what does it mean? Why is it interesting? Um, you know, what can it tell us about Palestinians as a people, but also just as, as you know, human beings, as members of this of this large family? Um, so I think that's it's it's I think that's what we're trying to do, and I think that's what it does is just it it I think affirms and it empowers and it mobilizes people as well. It affirms and it empowers. So, Diana, share with KCA listeners. I'm going to put you on the spot, right? <laughs> share with us your story. Tell us your story. What is your story? My story? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm Palestinian. Um, I was born in Canada. My parents immigrated. Um, they were um, they met in Kuwait in the 60s. Uh, so they, like uh, tens of thousands of other Palestinians, went to the Gulf, in, in particular Kuwait, uh, to work. My mother was a school teacher. My father was an accountant. Um, they married there, and then they immigrated to Canada in the late 60s. Uh, I was born there along with two brothers. Um, and then in 1978, we returned to Kuwait. Uh, or my parents returned to Kuwait. We, you know, hadn't lived there, so we moved there. Um, and then I finished school, high school in Kuwait, and I went to the United States for college and graduate school, and uh, I spent about 20 years in the U.S. studying and then working um, as a professor at Dartmouth College. So, um, and then, you know, um, I felt that it was time to, you know, to make a change, mm-hmm. and uh, I sort of you know, felt that I, you know, I, I have to say, I loved living in the United States. I lived there for 20 years, all my adult life, but I thought it was, you know, I was at a certain age where it was, it was time to maybe, you know, uh, do something different. So I was lucky enough to get this job at the museum and it really, you know, I've never looked back. It's been, it's been wonderful. It's been rewarding. Oh, you know, yeah. I I mean, professionally and also personally, it's been a, it's been a great, um, you know, I, I mean, I have to say that I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I can, you know, I'm a, I, I can work in the West Bank, but I can also leave the West Bank. I mean, that's a really important thing to say that I, um, I'm not stuck there like most of the West Bankers or the, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip or the Palestinians in the camps. I mean, I can, I can you know, leave and come back um, pretty easily, which makes, maybe makes the transition a lot easier. Um, Could you just describe what that process is? And because you say it's easy, but I'm sure in comparison for what people are used to traveling around the world, it's not. I mean, I, I, you know, I need a, I need a special, you know, visa to enter, um, which is, you know, I'm I'm not going to go into that, but, Uh but, you know, I have to cross, you know, either I enter from um, through Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, or I I cross over from Jordan. Um, There's usually a lot of questioning um, because. Um, you know, they know I'm Palestinian, even though I have a Canadian passport. Um, you know, I think it's, it's the idea of a Palestinian returning. It's not so much that I'm a security threat. It's more that, you know, I'm doing what the Israeli state doesn't want me to do as a Palestinian is to return. Um, it's, it's a hassle, but it's not, you know, it's, you get used to it. I mean, <laughs> it's more, yeah, it's more of a hassle than anything else. But I can, I can leave. I can go through the checkpoints. When I'm in Ramallah, I can leave and I can go to Jerusalem. I can enter, you know, the 1948 areas or Israel, if you want to call it, um, with relative ease. I'm not stuck at a checkpoint for very long. Um, that's I because don't need you've it. got a Canadian passport. Because I've got a Canadian passport. If there's not traffic, I can enter, yeah. I mean, if, if I weren't, if I had a West Bank ID, I would require a permit to enter Jerusalem, for instance, from Ramallah, which can take, you know, I don't know how long it takes, a few days, a week to, you know, receive a permit. Then you have to, you know, cross the checkpoint. Um, and it can take, you know, 
for me, it takes if I'm taking public transportation, it takes about an hour to get to Jerusalem. It's only 14 kilometers away. I mean, or 11. I mean, it's 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 incredibly, ridiculously close. Yet, you know, quite a distance. It's pretty far, and it's sad. I mean, and you were asking about how these settlements have sort of carved up the the West Bank. I mean, it's you know they've sort of uh, isolated all these cities from one another. I mean, this you know a natural flow movement of people from Bethlehem to Jerusalem to Hebron to Nablus to Tulkarem and Jenin and and Jerusalem, and, and you know that has is no longer the case. Mm-hmm. It's a hassle. You have to think twice about you know getting up and going somewhere. Right. You say it's a hassle. You have to think twice about getting up and going somewhere. And actually what will happen is that uh, Palestinians in Gaza won't be able to visit the Palestinian Museum in the West Bank. Is that they won't, I mean, no, they can. I mean, they have to get a permit um, to leave Gaza and to enter. You know, you have to enter Israel to get to the West Bank. Right. I mean, there's, you know, um, so it's very I mean, it's it's. It's virtually almost impossible for them to leave. It's very, very difficult to get out of Gaza or to get into Gaza. So the the Gazans are not most likely not going to come to our museum, which is why, again, um, we placing so much emphasis on our on the virtual component, on our online archive, on the virtual museum that we're trying to set up, um, because we they can't come to us. Palestinians in Gaza cannot come to us. Um, so we have to come to them. And it won't just be um, virtual. I mean, I, we're also um, thinking about setting up partnerships with, you know, cultural organizations in places, you know, in the Gaza Strip, throughout the West Bank, um, and in neighboring Arab countries, and even, you know, throughout the world, if we can, set up partnerships where we can, you know, have exhibitions there. We can do events that are being sort of hosted by the Palestinian Museum in partnership with another cultural organization, again, to bring our work and and our events and, you know, what we're doing to Palestinians throughout the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's I, something we... shocking. Uh, no, no, I was just going to say, Kathleen, that it's something shocking that uh, Palestinians from thousands of miles away from Berzade can get to the museum. But um, Palestinians, you know, half an hour drive away, locked inside Gaza, can't visit the museum. Yeah, that's called, I think that's called apartheid, wouldn't you say? Or segregation, or one and the same. What do you yeah, think? It's, it's a part. Of course, it's apartheid. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And and no, mm-hmm. and we in the West support that with our tax dollars. That's what's pathetic and sad. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a population. You know, the, the Palestinians. I mean, I know the show isn't about that, but you know, one has to say that there's a you know population in Gaza. That is, you know, living in an open air prison. It's, it's no more nor less. You have West Bankers who are, yes, they have relatively more freedom of movement, but again, they're, they, you know, you cannot go to Jerusalem if you're a resident of the West Bank without a permit. If you live in Ramallah and you want to go to Jerusalem, I mean, that's the natural, I mean, it's, you know, the, there's, there's for centuries been a natural sort of movement of people between these cities that is no longer the case. Um, you know, the separation wall, the barrier wall is, is, is you know, um, a tragedy. It's a catastrophe. I mean, you know, people's villages are divided, towns are divided, lands, you know, people's property is divided. Um, it's, it's, it's very demoralizing. It's, it's really, um, it really is a tragedy. And it's, 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 it, what's the word worse than tragedy? Is there a word worse than tragedy? Horrific. No, that's not the word. What is it? Tell me, Harry. It's a, it's just a great injustice. I mean, I, I, I mean, hopefully the situation will, will be resolved. I don't, I don't seem very hopeful and, and many people don't, but as well, but it, you know, it's, it's, um, well, I mean, and so these are the sort of, this is, this is the reality of, you know, the situation. This is what we're dealing with. And we just, we just have to work with that. And again, that's why we're sort of doing the kind of programs that we do. Mm-hmm. Virtual it's a online. Okay. Yeah, that's oh, a, it's a catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah, a catastrophe is a better word, more severe, more uh, apt. I think catastrophe. Yeah, I think uh-huh. that's apt. Catastrophe. Catastrophic. It's catastrophic. I believe it is catastrophic. Well, I'm gl- grateful for you, Diana, for being on the show. Um, we were just speaking with our guest today was Diana Abuala, who is the. Uh, 
head of research and collections at the Palestinian Museum. Uh, my co-host, Harry Fear, is in Germany right now doing speeches, doing speeches about the situation in Gaza. Did I describe that properly, Harry? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, outreach, <laughs> educational talks about living in Gaza, what the conflict is like in Gaza, and uh, the daily abuses in Gaza. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Diana, for taking the time to, to join us on Palestine today. Also, I want to, I want, I definitely want uh, Palestine today to participate in terms of either donating or our show to your museum. I would love something like that because we have many Palestinians on the show. And we have many artists who are Palestinian. In fact, I think off the top of my head, I'm thinking of Hashim Jrak, who is on our show. He's an artist. I would love his stuff to be in the museum. I don't know. We'll talk about it, right, Diana? Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I look forward to it. Okay. Definitely. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Harry. You know I love you, Harry. <laughs> oh, Kathleen, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you for joining us on Palestine Today. Next week we'll have another great guest. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Bye. You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. From the KCAA Weather Center, I'm Chris Earl Phillips. For this afternoon, partly sunny, gradually becoming sunny, and a high near 86. Tonight, patchy fog after 11. Otherwise, increasing clouds, low around 60. On Sunday, patchy fog before 11. Otherwise, partly sunny, gradually becoming sunny, and a high of 89. Sunday night, mostly clear, low around 61. Heading into the work week, we started on Monday with sunny skies and a high near 92. Monday night, mostly clear, low 61. Tuesday, sunny with a high of 90. That's your weather forecast for this hour from the station that leaves no listener behind. NBC News Radio, AM 1050 KCAA. This is the KCAA Community Calendar. The Inland Empire 66ers and Toyota and Scion of Redlands presents Protect and Serve Night, honoring all law enforcement and a benefit to support the families of Detective Jeremiah McKay and Deputy Alex Collins, Saturday, July 20th at San Manuel Stadium as the 66ers take on the Lake Elsinore Storm. The game starts at 7.05. 50% of each ticket purchased will go directly to these families. Special game-worn 66er jerseys resembling the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department will be auctioned off as well as other memorabilia throughout the game. For more information, contact Adam Franey at area code 909-495-6633.